Hello everyone and welcome to We Meet at Digital Days. My name is Lisa Richter and I will moderate this presentation. We are very pleased that you took the time to participate in our virtual conference. The topic of this presentation is DC-DC input filtering, watch out instability is about. Our speaker is Mohamed Al-Alami. He will hold the presentation and will answer your questions. Before we start, I would like to point out one thing. You will be muted during the presentation. This means that you cannot ask questions via microphone during the presentation. Nevertheless, you have the opportunity to ask questions during the presentation at any time via the chat function. You will find the chat function in the control panel. This presentation will be about 30 minutes long. The chat questions will be answered in a Q&A session following the webinar. There are five to 10 minutes in addition scheduled for this. If we are unable to answer all of your questions within this time, we will answer them via email afterwards. If you still have any other questions left, just mail us at exhibition at we-online.com. We will try to answer all of your questions promptly. At the end of the webinar, you'll be asked to participate in a feedback survey. We would be pleased if you take the time to fill out a survey and help us to improve our event. You will receive the link for the presentation in the next few days, and the recording will be available at our website shortly. So now I will hand over to our speaker, and I wish you a nice presentation. Super. Thank you very much, Lisa. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me today uh, for this uh, quick webinar on input filtering of a DC to DC converter. The title says, watch out, instability is about. Now let's see what that means. Uh, today, as part of the agenda of uh, uncovering uh, input filtering for DC DC converters, we'll start off by identifying sources of EMI as the reason why we would be naturally interested in introducing a DC-DC input filter. We'll also look at the input filter design considerations accordingly. So what do we need to take into account when we are putting together this filter? Uh, this is gonna be also shown as a step-by-step -step design. So um, starting from uh, inception all the way to creating that filter and testing it. We'll show you some practical test results as well as some LT SPICE simulation results too. And that's what will happen sort of towards the back end where we will look at this practical design example. So, starting off with sources for EMI. And for today's uh, webinar on input filtering, input filtering is a very big topic. You can do anything with input filtering. You can put all sorts of different components, filters in there. What we're going to concentrate on today, and I guess uh, instability is about is the, is the clue, is filters that are associated with conducted emissions, with noise being generated by the switching frequency of your DC-DC regulator. So a relatively lower type noise. Uh, you are also, um, it is very also, it's also very important that you introduce filters for the radiated emission side of things, but that's not for today's webinar, maybe for another day. So the, from a theory point of view, looking at the typical signal that drives a MOSFET, uh, so gate drive or the drain source um, uh, junction voltage, and the currents that flow around a DC-DC regulator, what you will see is the technology trend moving forward is going for higher and higher frequency. This has been going on for quite a few years now, but even with the advent of things like silicon carbide, gallium nitride type uh, MOSFETs, even the standard silicon MOSFETs, we are switching at higher and higher frequencies. Now, what that means or indicates is that our rate of change of voltage or current with time is becoming faster and faster. Basically, T rise and T fall are fairly quick. And just to show you the generic impact of something like this, the idea when you're going for a faster and faster signal, what happens is your harmonic content of that signal becomes higher. In other words, the amount of EMI content noise interference is higher. I'm not going to go through the equations that were shown 
uh, in a lot of detail. That's again more EMI related, but this is again showing you uh, an indication of a faster signal rise time compared to a slower one in terms of uh, the Fourier transform, the Fourier content of that signal, the fast Fourier transform of it using LP splice. And um, so, cut a long story short, we do have an issue as we're going up in frequency. That issue, of course, is the harmonics initially of the uh, switching uh, signal, um, fundamental in this case, 530 odd kilohertz and uh, uh, um, uh, uh, more above of that or further up from that. So that's one issue. Uh, the other thing that we also need to take into account is the type of noise uh, when we are looking at input filtering. And again, today, we are going to concentrate predominantly, like I mentioned, on conducted emissions. But we also need to concentrate on the type of noise, like I said, differential or common mode. I hope most people are familiar with the two concepts. The differential current, of course, is the current responsible for the delivery of power to the load. The common mode is the, uh, the noise that's associated with parasitic, usually elements that allow that current to flow back through your ground chassis, earth, etc. Um, so these two are uh, ex in existence in a power supply stage. So you need to con be concerned about both differential as well as common mode. Uh, but for today, all we're going to concentrate on is the differential mode side of things. For common mode, we will leave that again for another day. So the concentration uh, and the part that can have an impact on instability again is the differential mode filter. So to finish off this section uh, on EMI, we just look at a typical type of buck regulator design and just to have an appreciation of some of the signals that are flowing around that design. We mentioned yesterday, those who attended the seminar with me on power inductors, the current, uh, the inductor current, I beg your pardon. We can also look at the diode current and the input current coming in. So you can see these signals have got a fairly high rate of rise of current with time. They are switching at the switching frequency. They have got higher amplitudes. So filtering this type of noise is important from an EMI compliance point of view. I see a lot of these issues with interfaces, and particularly things like PoE, power over Ethernet, um, uh, standard 48 volt uh, rail systems as well, 24 volts as well. So it's on these types of rails is where it's important to uh, uh, take into consideration the amount of noise that is coming out of your power supply, your DC DC. One more thing I mentioned yesterday, which is capacitors and parasitic elements in particular are on capacitors. Now I'll put this uh, here just to also put, make, uh, make the point that with components, parasitics, they limit the effectiveness of this component to filter. So if we say that we don't want to introduce an input filter, that's fine. It's an extra couple of components, okay. But we all we need to take into account that our filter components that exist as part and parcel of the standard topology of DC DC that we are using, in other words, the caps and the inductors, need to be of a high enough performance, let's say, to give us sufficient attenuation. In other words, these parasitics can have a big impact on the quality of filtering that is provided by the component. And that being the case, it might not even be sufficient for us to rely on these. In some occasions, it may very well be the case, but depending on the specification requirements of your application and design, this is where implementing input filtering might be necessary. And this is where we go into how do we implement, and let's have a look at what we need to consider when we are putting together an input filter. So an input filter is a very simple type circuit, an LC or a PI or a T. I'm going to talk about just a simple LC filter today. So introducing an LC filter is something that's very simple. It's really not worthy of you know, spending all of this time talking to you about it. So please don't leave yet. I, I haven't finished yet. So there is an issue, though, with introducing a very simple EMI LC filter 
at, uh, at the input of a DCDC -DC regulator. And note my words, it's the input that is critical, not the output, it's the input. And the reason being is this risk of instability. So that will become clearer as we go through the next few slides uh, as to why there could be an instability there. Uh, but I just want you to imagine you've got a nicely working unit with a nicely working DC DC input at that unit, and you fail your EMI because of conducted emissions, and you say, Oh, I'll just stick in an LC, if, if, uh, get rid of it. You put that in, and now your power supply is not working, it's gone unstable. So your whole unit is down. Could cause damage as well if, uh, if you haven't got protection uh, on your unit. So that being the case, uh, it's something that's really worth taking into consideration when we are designing this input filter. So why? Why can I get this issue with having an input filter? Let's go to the power supply to the DC-DC regulator and have a look at how does this DC-DC regulator behave in terms of its relationship between input voltage and input current on this side here. What sort of load does this DC-DC regulator present to my LC filter, which I'm planning to put here, okay? So if we look at the input and the uh, voltage and current, based on the power coming in and out of a regulator, the power at the input and power at the output, let's say it's an ideal circuit, just to make life simpler, it's gonna be the same. So power is constant. Uh, if you get a variation, a step change in voltage or in current, what's going to happen if the power is constant? And let's investigate that as we go through. With the basic equations, power equals voltage times current, both at the input and at the output. And what happens as you change the input voltage, if you increase the input voltage, what's going to happen to the input current to keep the power the same? That's going to drop so that V and I counter each other, so P remains constant. So now my relationship between V and I is not following Ohm's law anymore. It's not, it's not V equals IR anymore. It's going in reverse in a way. And that's what we see at the input of a power supply or a power DC-DC regulator. That presents what we call a constant power load to the filter. A constant power load has got this profile between voltage and current. And as Mr. Ohm told us, uh, the relationship between voltage and current gives us resistance. And if we look at the slope at any point in time on that curve to give me that resistance value, basically, that slope will be negative. So in other words, the resistance or the impedance, let's say, that is presented by the DCDC -DC is negative. And this is where this instability can occur. If you end up loading an LC filter with a negative resistance, you could create an oscillation. Now, note the word could. It's not always the case necessarily, but it could be the case. Um, and this is what we're gonna investigate a little bit further as we go through today as well, is where could this instability occur and when, and what? how do we need to identify the worst case scenario and how do we make sure that this filter is not going to cause this oscillation that might occur and render my power supply unfunctional or useless or damaged. This is what happens when you again put in a negative resistance on an LC filter. You can see, of course, the oscillation starting to take place if you do not have what's called damping. So you need to damp this filter. So this is the first time we've talked about damping. And this is not naturally the hint for the solution to this problem is damping this filter. But what we're going to talk about again in a bit more detail is how to damp naturally. And do we always need damping? And how do we calculate the values of these damping components? Okay. So first of all, damping involves the, the various different methods, by the way, for damping. Um, the uh, series resistance of the inductor can be part of your damping circuit, but usually that's very small and we want it to be very small, naturally, because we do, we do not want to have a lot of losses in terms of the full current flowing through the inductor. So, so that's not a good way of putting damping, putting a resistor here. But you can put in a resistor in parallel with the inductor, you can put another inductor in parallel with the inductor to damp it, uh, 
we have chosen here to use the method of damping with a capacitor and a resistor, a damping capacitor and damping resistor. I've used this method many times in the past. And in this case, uh, the damping resistor and the damping capacitor allow us to go from at the cutoff frequency of the filter, very high ringing into a more damped, comfortable or, or low amplitude, let's say, the response of that filter from an impedance point of view or from a frequency response uh, of voltage point of view or current for that matter point of view. So this is where it's key that we ensure that um, our filter is damped, is the message, uh, in order to avoid this issue of uh, instability in the power supply. Let's have a look at the step-by-step -step design. How are we going to do this? How are we going to place these components, calculate them, and so on? So a starting point is we need to identify uh, what sort of noise that we're going to get from our power supply. Now, some of you will say, oh, it means I'm going to have to test this. Yes, and testing conducted emissions is relatively simple. You can do it with little equipment in your lab. Um, um, so it's not necessarily that you need to go to an EMC lab to do this testing. You don't necessarily also need to have a spectrum analyzer. You can potentially use an FFT function on a decent oscilloscope to give you an indication. Okay, of course, it's not going to be the, uh, the final result that's going to give you your certification uh, uh, thumbs up for conducted emissions, but it will give you an idea of what how noise content, harmonic content you've got, and what impact the filter is having on this. So that's the first point. The second is to design and calculate the filter components based on the noise amplitude that you will see. And the example is coming, by the way, to show you how we can actually do this. Then we'll check with LT Spice. We love LT Spice. Those of you who were here with me yesterday will have seen the models that we have for our inductors and capacitors, very accurate ones. So they'll give you a very good representation of the behavior of these parts. And we will finish off by checking, of course, the conducted emissions with the filter implementing. Uh, the design was done uh, based on uh, a starting point of using uh, the demo board, the LTDC2457A. So this is an LT uh, design board. It's got a switching frequency of 400 kilohertz. Input voltage is set at 24. Output is at 12 with 4 amps, so a substantial amount of uh, throughput power here, about 50 watts or so. Uh, the setup, as you can see here, we have got the unit there, and that's connected through a DC listen into our HAMEG spectrum analyzer. And the results that we had, as you can see in here, uh, is we have got quite a substantial peak at the 400 fundamental and uh, about 72 dBs. Um, we have, and I do apologize for this, there is a little mistake here. So we should be comparing to this level up here as the quasi-peak level. This is the average level here of the waveform. So, uh, it, but in all cases, it does not really matter. At the end of the day, from looking by looking at the amount of attenuation that you need to introduce, you are looking at the uh, insertion loss of the filter that you are designing. So in this case, I need to go from here to below this line, let's say, but I'm gonna just keep it with the below this line. Let's just uh, go uh, um, uh, with a lot of margin, let's say, on the attenuation that we need. So and that comes to 24 dBs and we add margin on top of that and we say, okay, we want 40 dBs. Now, this is where you will have your degrees of freedom. Yesterday, I was talking a lot about degrees of freedom in the design. So you can always change these values. If you find 40 dBs means your inductor is this big and your capacitor is this high, no. So you can go back and revisit this. But if you can still achieve this with a reasonable size inductor and a capacitor and cost-wise as well, then fine, why not? The more the better. Because you will see that some of the, that there are parasitics as we have seen yesterday, which render these components not ideal in behavior. So we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit as well. So um, how do we calculate the component values? That's what's coming up. Uh, the first thing is we identify the cutoff frequency of our filter. Now that is based on the switching frequency of the regulator or the fundamental of the noise that you saw, which is 400 kilohertz. And usually the rule of thumb is go a decade below that that brings me to a cutoff of my filter to 40 kilohertz. 
So that's the starting point. This is where I want to have my frequency, my filter cut off. Why is it? Where do we come up with this rule of thumb as a decade? Because a filter, an LC filter, is a is a second order filter. So by the time you've passed a decade in frequency, what with the filter will do is give you 40 dBs of attenuation. The role of for the filter is 40 dBs per decade, of an LC filter, I should say, is 40 dBs per decade. So now I'm getting my 40 dBs that I wanted from my design at 400 kilohertz, okay? So that is the way that you can also look at it um, as a, a design for the cutoff frequency. If you wanted more, you'll have to cut off earlier. So maybe 30 kilohertz or 20 kilohertz. Next, we can start off by using the very basic and simple equation, the one over two pi root LC, to calculate the L and the C for my filter. So in this case, we get 9.4 microfarads and one and a half microhenries as the key values for our capacitor and inductor. Now, is there anything stopping me from using it the other way around? One and a half microfarads and 9.4 microhenries. The equation says it's the same. So where is the, the alternative or the option? Why, why, why can I use this or that? What would be the criteria for selecting either option? I guess if you have got a high current in the circuit, I would use a lower inductance. If you've got a higher voltage in the circuit, I would use a lower capacitance to keep those sizes, costs, efficiency better. If you've got high voltage and high current, I'm sorry, I haven't got an answer for you. Ask somebody else. So I'm just joking. No, but there will be an option to go halfway house between the two in order to optimize your design. So again, we can see with this filter that you have got this overshoot, this ringing, this double zero, double pole at the cutoff frequency. Now, one thing that's also very important to say here is that this behavior here is also a function of your load, of what your power supply DC-DC regula regulator is presenting to your filter. And we'll come to that hopefully at the very back end of this seminar to indicate how that can be a, a, something that's important to account for. We've got here uh, the two equations that allow us to calculate the damping capacitor. And the damping capacitor is usually estimated as a multiple of the filter capacitor. So we've done the filter capacitor at 9.4 uh, microfarads. Uh, the damping capacitor is two times, four times, six times. Doesn't have to be exactly an integer, it could be two and a half, it could be 1.34, it doesn't matter. So it's the ratio, but we, we of course, it needs to be bigger than uh, the um, uh, filter capacitor. So I say four times is usually the, the uh, a good value to use without it becoming too big naturally, then the capacitor becomes sizable. Um, you can go down, but it starts impacting uh, the roll off of your filter. So that's where, the, the juggling act becomes uh, or comes into it. Uh, the damping resistor is calculated based on this equation, which takes into account the quality factor uh, as well as this ratio n between CD and CF. The main predominant factor is root LF over CF. This one does have an impact, but the main impact is from this uh, to give you the stability. So. We've calculated these values based on our current design. So we've got 9.4, one and a half already. We've chosen N equals four. So that gives us around 37 microfarads of capacitance and 0.4 ohms of uh, damping resistance. There is our filter. And we'll have a look at it. This is all by the way generated, I believe in, in Excel. In terms of the calculations, you can we can put in these equations in there and just get you the calculation. I'll show you the calculations for this. So you can see here undamped and damped filter from a response point of view and from an impedance point of view. We'll do the same like I mentioned last time in LT Spice. So we've introduced actual components in LT Spice to show you the behavior without and with damping. So without damping, you can see the cutoff is got a very high overshoot. With damping, it's nicely rolled off. Note that we have chosen a smaller value of capacitance here, and that is valid 
So you don't necessarily have to go for the 37 and a half. You can go lower. This will have naturally an impact on the value of ESR. But like I say, it's not going to be a huge impact. In this occasion, at least it wasn't. So the calculation would have been 0.34, I think, or 0.35 in terms of ESR. So we call it ESR. In some occasions, you can use the equivalent series resistance of the uh, electrolytic, if you use an electrolytic here. Uh, but you can also use, uh, for example, um, an MLCC and put in an external resistor in series with it. So that's the option there. Uh, we've also put in a step to show you what actually LT spice in the orange here compares to the calculations based on those equations that we've shown. So we're comparing calculation to LT spice. And you can see that there is a bit more damping on the LT spice side of things so from a simulation point of view. And that's, of course, is associated with that um, loading that you've got on the filter as well. We finally introduce our filter as part of the design that you saw. And what we see in here is the attenuation has dropped down to 42 dBs from 72. So I've pretty much got 30 dBs of attenuation or insertion loss from that filter. Okay. So one thing to note uh, as well, we started off saying we're going to get 40 dBs. The LC filter showed that it was going to give me 40 dBs, but when you start damping the performance of the filter, the roll-off slows down a bit, and you will see also this as we're going through in a little bit. So that's also something to watch out for. I'll finish off uh, by giving you or showing you uh, an LT SPICE example. Um, people tend to talk a lot throughout these presentations about the uh, frequency domain behavior, the gain phase plots that you've been seeing before, the amplitude of the filter. Um, and there is very little usually in the form of showing what actually happens uh, in the time domain in a power supply. Uh, so I've selected to use this uh, as a simple design, DCDC. Uh, this is a synchronous book. Uh, it's got 10 volts coming in, uh, 5 volts are at the output. We have got a full loading condition of 5 amps, uh, switches to light load condition of 50 milliamps, and this uh, LT8613 chipset switches at 700 kilohertz. And what I have done in here is I have introduced an LC input filter. Now, some of you may look at this and say, hey, Mo, where is the damping? You've given us a headache about damping today. You've talked about damping and damping, and I can't see any damping here. So the idea behind this is to show you that you can use the actual ESR of the electrolytic to give you damping. Now, uh, realistically, using the ESR is a bit of a risky business because ESR, as we, those of you who have attended the capacitors presentation yesterday will know, ESR does change. It changes with temperature, it changes with frequency, and with aluminium electrolytics, it's particularly prevalent when it comes to the change in temperature. So we have to be a bit more careful about using that as a value, especially uh, if we're going at very wide temperature operating conditions with, uh, with uh, our unit. So that's something to keep in the back of the mind. Sometimes if you are able to use more a more fixed value of a capacitor across temperature frequency, then you're better off putting a series resistor because you can guarantee the value for that um, uh, to damp your, your supply. But that's what I've done, what I have done here. Uh, this uh, component has got an ESR value, which I switch using this dot step param from zero to one. So no damping to one ohms worth of uh, equivalent series or equivalent series resistance or damping resistor is the same. And what you also see on this simulation here is the filter simulation in the frequency domain. Now I'm going to shuffle across and quickly show you on LT Spice, that simulation of that filter. That's the same filter that you've just seen. And there is the capacitor there, just to show you. It has got a resistor R, which will be flicked between zero and one. And when we run the simulation, this is zero, undamped, this is damped. Note the phase and what happens to the phase 
at the cutoff frequency here. So this is what's causing your instability. Note that we have got a negative resistance for our power supply simulation. So the simulation of the DC-DC is been done with a negative resistive load. In other words, Y minus four, I mentioned five, vol uh, five volts, five uh, amps, so that's 25 watts. 25 watts at the input of 10 volts will give you four ohms as the input impedance uh, to the supply or to the filter. And that's where the minus four or the four comes from. The minus is to represent the negative impedance. And this is where the danger comes in. Now, how does this danger manifest itself? I've been talking about instability. Okay, let me show you that instability then. No. Here we go. Let's show you that instability. And here we go, time domain. Now, if you do not believe this overshoot business or, or phase advance or phase lead problem that you're getting, this is hopefully will give you an idea of what's going on in the time domain. Uh, the starting point of this simulation that you see here is uh, I've just run the power supply without any filtering, just to give you confidence that it rises up to five volts out. Beg your pardon, this is the output voltage. It's loaded by five amps. This is the full load condition. This is just a flag indicating full load or light load. And the input voltage is 10 volts, like I promised you. So everything is working fine in that regulator. Now we stop and we switch on again with and without damping on the input filter. Now we have introduced the input filter. And with that input filter, it's either damped in blue, and you can see it's nicely damped, or undamped, here is the oscillation, here is the instability that we were talking about, okay? Um, if we go into light load, I mentioned earlier, this is also a function of the load resistance or the load of the power supply or the impedance, input impedance of the power supply. What you see here, if you go into light load and you switch on, you have got some level of inherent damping and your power supply will go back into stability. So albeit you have got an undamped power supply in red, it's still going into some level of stability. However, you do a quick load transient, you go from light load to full load, and we're back to where we started an instability. So you are not in a very good position if you do not dump in, in summary. Um, do you always need to dump? No, it does. It is clearly the case that it is uh, um, impacted also by your uh, impedance of the power supply. The worst case condition is absolute maximum power minimum input voltage. That would be the condition that would result in your stability, instability, and that's what we usually test for in order to design our filter. If you're stable there, hopefully you'll be stable across the operating conditions. And I finish off with contacts like I've done yesterday. So feel free to contact us. Uh, this is our contact page web, web page link. So you can just enter the company and the country that you're in, and it'll give you the details down here to contact any of our offices. Thank you very much uh, for your time and for bearing with me. Um, happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mo, for an interesting presentation. Pleasure. Now, like you already mentioned, uh, we take a look at the questions. Um, just a second, till they come in. Just have a look at a question window. So how do you calculate the negative impedance of your SMPs? Ah, so the, the negative impedance, um, you can simply, um, I guess the simplest way of trying to, uh, to calculate it is like what I've done earlier, is simulate the worst case scenario, which would be the maximum power. In my case in here, it was 25 watts. I, that's output power. I go back to my input. What's my worst case input voltage? In my situation, I said it's 10 volts. So 10 volts squared, 100 divided by my 25 watts of power gives me four ohms. So that is a very simple and crude way of simulating uh, 
the 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 behavior or the impedance of a power supply. And actually, the impedance of a power supply changes with with frequency. So we are just looking here at the, the DC equivalent point. I hope that answers the question. <laughs> I hope so too. Otherwise, we can answer it uh, via mail afterwards. Okay. Um, there's one more question. Is there a good way of seeing any dawn of instability? I mean, in case it is not obvious with the DC-DC converter not working at all, is it that the conducted emission just get worse, with, uh, which is I can measure? Is there a way of seeing uh, any dawn of instability? I mean, in the case of the DC-DC converter not working. Yeah, I mean, the instability in a DC-DC, of course, might not necessarily be associated, and I think I've got your question right here. So it might not necessarily be associated with um, the noise uh, or the instability because of an input filter. You might not have an input filter, and you still have an instability in the power supply. So that could be a multitude of various different things. It could be to do with your current sense signal um, uh, and instability there. It could be with something called subharmonic oscillations in the power supply, which causes jitter and Sometimes you might skip pulses uh, as part and parcel. So there are various different reasons why you may get an instability in the power supply um, and which can render it sort of uh, unstable or unable to work. Um, so I would suggest you look at the control signals. Uh, you said, what can I measure? I, I would measure things, my current sense signal. Um, I would look, if you can look at the compensation signal at the output, I mean, there are, there, there are limitations, it depends on the chipset that you are using as to what you can probe, what you can't probe. Um, so looking at naturally the, the drain source signal uh, across the MOSFET. So all of these can give you a clue as to maybe where that instability is taking place or what's happening with those signals, uh, if they are skipping pulses or you're seeing a, a variation in amplitude of that signal. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Okay, great. Thank you. So now we have finished with this presentation. If there are any questions left, we will answer them via email afterwards. Thank you very much for your attention and I hope you enjoyed our presentation. Thank you, everyone.